Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of themindrenewed.com, coming to you from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today I'm very pleased to welcome to the programme Mr. Charles Strange, co-founder of the Michael Strange Foundation and the father of cryptologic technician collection first class Michael Strange, who at 25 years old was a highly decorated combat veteran with numerous awards, including the Bronze Star Medal with Valor, Purple Heart Medal, Defence Meritorious Service Medal and other campaign and unit decorations. Michael had been one of the members of SEAL Team 6 that was reported to have assassinated Osama bin Laden in Pakistan at the beginning of May 2011. But then, on August the 6th of that same year, just over three months later, Michael was tragically killed along with 14 other members of SEAL Team 6 and uh, 23 other personnel when the helicopter they were flying in was shot down by Taliban in the Tangy Valley in eastern Afghanistan. But there remain many, many serious questions about that day. Many questions that the families of those who were killed are continuing to ask and finding that their frustrations are basically being heightened by the persistent lack of transparency from the authorities who seem to basically want to avoid talking about this tragedy. And it's to share with us his experience and very deep concerns that we are joined by Charles Strange. Charles, thanks very much for agreeing to come on the show. Thank you, Julian. Appreciate you helping us out, spreading the word about Extortion 17 and all the tragedy here. Help us maybe get some answers. Yeah, I really do hope so. And I thank you ever so much for coming on because I said to you when I chatted to you briefly yesterday that, you know, I was really, really moved by that speech that you gave at the press conference. Um, You know, you were talking about Michael. You were saying, you know, what a brave chap he was, you know, really talented. And, uh, you know, these grave concerns that you have about what happened that day and all these non-answers that basically you've been getting from the authorities. So, uh, you know, I'm very honoured that you are with us today. And I've got John Masseria to thank for linking us up. So thanks, John, for doing that. Um, So could we start, Charles, with a kind of window into your background to kind of set the scene? Um, Have you always lived in Philadelphia? Yes. We were born and raised right here in Philadelphia. The nickname for Philadelphia is the City of Brotherly Love. Main points for the country, for the United States, is we uh, have the Betsy Ross House, who made the flag for America, Independence Mall, and the Liberty Bell, which is all part of the bringing the United States Constitution and uh, freedoms and let freedom ring and here in Philadelphia. Uh Is that the Sousa March, Liberty Bell? Is that talking about the Philadelphia Liberty Bell? Excuse me, I didn't hear you. Oh, there's a very famous piece of music by Sousa called Liberty Bell, is that? I believe so, I believe so, yes, yes. Uh And what do you do for a living then? I was a union construction worker for 17 years, and uh, then I was working at a casino dealing uh, cards, mini bock and blackjack and some other things, and I used to own a recovery house for Alcoholics Anonymous and people with drug problems. I own my own little uh, recovery house for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. Great work. And you're you're married to Mary, is that right? Is this your second marriage? Yes, Mary Ann. And Michael was one of, is it it four children from your first marriage? Uh, Yes. Mm -hmm. And do you have any uh, stepchildren as well? Yes, Andrew and Rachel. Mm -hmm. Mary has two and I have four. And Michael, Charles and Caitlin and Carly. Carly's the youngest. And uh, some like the Brady Bunch, I guess. Uh, (laughs) Me and Michael's Molly got divorced. I was single for a little while. I met this beautiful lady, as you've seen in the... uh, interview down in Washington, D.C. She's my rock. She helps me, you know, ever since that worst day of my life. And uh, yeah. my true love. Yeah, it helps you to ride the storm of the unimaginable because quite honestly, you know, sitting here, it, it is unimaginable, the idea of, of losing a child. So I have great respect for your speaking out about this and asking questions about it. Um, Thank you. So let's move then to talking about Michael himself then. Uh, so let's find out a little bit more about what Michael was like growing up. What was he like as a young lad? Michael put his mind to something. Michael could do it. Uh, I remember uh, he was eight years old going out for a baseball team, the Mayfair Shamrocks here in Philadelphia. And the kid pitching was actually 11. It was 8 to 10, but he just made the cutoff. He was a big kid. 
and the coach put Michael in there at a bat, and uh, the kid almost hit him with a fastball, and Michael walked out, and the coach said, what are you doing, Michael? And he said, I'm not standing in there, he almost hit me. And uh, after a few practices and talking to Michael and uh, his determination, not only did he become a great hitter, he became the catcher for the kid. So he was catching them fastballs at eight years old. The other kid was 11. He put his mind to it. And uh, something about Michael, uh, he made everybody around him feel special. Um, I've had uh, numerous guys from the Navy, young men from the neighborhood. I was Michael's best friend. Mr. Strange, let me tell you, me and Michael did this, this, and this. Michael was my best friend. So he made everybody around him feel special, yes. You made friends very easily. That's the impression I'm getting there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Michael would uh, easily, you know, he'd hold the door for you, make a joke, help you, you know, even at a young age. Mm. Like uh, somebody carrying the groceries, an older lady carrying the groceries, and he'd put the football down and... Uh, Hold on, let's help her, run it up, you know. Was always going out of itself to help others. He must have been a very bright lad as well. I mean, he became a, a cryptologist, so I'm, I'm only guessing, but was he sort of very gifted in maths when he was at school? Yes, yes, in third grade. In third grade, they did a test, and uh, that's when they started. We noticed something about Michael with the schooling. He was in a public school. Mm-hmm. And then following year, we put him in Catholic school, which was uh, a smaller classes and more intense. And uh, he took off in there. You know, he accelerated. And he went to an all-boys Catholic high school here in Philadelphia called North Catholic. And there he started slacking up. And, uh, you know, he's uh, teens and uh, starting to feel the girls and chase the girls. And uh, he liked, he was working out. And he'd do a little bit of sports, not that much. Uh, he liked working in the gym and hang with his friends and his brother and his sister. Uh, it was just, we had a place down in uh, Delaware, which was known for its crabbing and fishing. And uh, we, we loved to go fishing, me, him, his brother, and sister. And it was funny, if his sister caught the first fish, he'd be like, why don't you bring that, Dad? That's when he was like 12, you know. Oh, give me that fishing rod, that's the lucky rod. But I'll tell you what, his sister was 15, she was in the park with two of her girlfriends and like six guys that were like three years older. Michael went in the park by himself, took his sister and the girls, got them in the car, and drove them about three miles away, and then kicked them out of the car. This is when there was pay phones. My daughter calls me. Michael Craig, me out of the park. He embarrassed me in front of everybody. Da 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 da. And I was walking on. We're, we're like 30 blocks away, Dad. I said, Oh, wait until I see him. I called Michael up. Found Michael. Oh, good job, Michael. Good job. <laughs> Keep him away from your sister. Yes. <laughs> so that's the kind of big brother he was. He had a sense of humor as well by the sound of it. Oh, my God. Yes, he was funny. Yeah. Uh, happy days, happy days. So how um, how is it he became interested in the U.S. Navy? Well, his senior year, the recruiters came. It was all boy Catholic high school. Came home, he said, Dad, I'm, I think I'm going to join uh, the military. I was talking to the Marines, and I was talking to this guy. I said, Mike, you're not joining the military. There's a war going on. And he looked at me, he's like, Dad, I, you know, you go for four years, you get the college money, da-da-da-da-da. I'm like, Mike, you're not going in the military. He turned 18. He said, Dad, I joined the military. I said, oh, all right, son, all right, you got a direction. And that's how he got into the military. And uh, they came and picked him up in June, and uh, they took him to the Great Lakes. And I went out there in Chicago seen him graduate boot camp and then from there they sent him to Florida to Pensacola, Florida and um, they gave him a test and here he had this remarkable uh, sense for decoding. Mm. So this is where he actually became a cryptologist. Yes. So this was the ability to decode messages from... Yes, yes, for decoding and different signals from uh, antennas and different things like that. He, uh, he, he, he mastered all that stuff from just learning OJT on the job training. Um, it was amazing what he could do in a cryptologist class. There's no books, there's no chalkboard, there's no windows. Everything's by the mind. Everything you got to remember. And then they would give you a test. Wow. The one kid I was talking to, he graduated from college. He had a bachelor's degree. 
And he said to Michael, what college did you go to? Michael said, I didn't go to college. I worked at a bar. <laughs> 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 you know, so he had to, you know, and he would bust everybody's hump, and uh, he took off for that. And he was naturally talented, yeah, by the sound of it. And an email that you sent to me, you said that he could intercept cell phone transmissions, he could break the Pashtun code for the day, and you said that he was able to locate where people were just by listening to things like streams and motorcycle engines and prayer calls and things like that. He had all this equipment for listening, but just by listening to those things, he could locate where the enemy was. Is that right? Yes, yes. He, he could figure out the password for uh, the daily for the bad guys so in the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, he could figure it out, and their location, and some of the guys were amazed, and, and the pilot ops never seen nothing like that. They just gave them um, the National Medal of Intelligence for, uh, hold on, my wife's here for a second. They gave them the National Intelligence Medal of Valor. Was that recently? Uh, last year. Only 17 ever been given out in the history of America. Wow. Yeah. And that dates all the way back, like with the wind talkers, with the Indians, how they would find out different signals and different things like that. So, was he a cryptologist while he was working with SEAL Team 2, or was it just when he was working with Team 6? Well, while he was with 2, he was in Hawaii. He was stationed in Hawaii. Physically, he was training and running and doing the code breaking there, and he uh, he became an E6, which is a level in our military pretty high up. He became an E6 in four years, which is unheard of from what I'm told to become an E6 in four years. Not many people could do it, mm. if any. And then he joined SEAL Team 6, which I understand is the elite group. Is that right? Yes, yes. Well, he got picked. You get picked to be with SEAL Team 6. Now, that's not the official name, is that right? Is it called DevGru? Is that the official name for it? Yes, they switched the name a few times recently, but DevGru, Naval Special Warfare Development Group, if you put in D-E-V-G-R-U, search, SEAL Team 6 pops up. Yeah. So could you tell us what kind of thing that SEAL Team 6 does? I mean, I'm guessing that it's a bit like what we've got over here with the SAS, you know, sort of counter-terrorism stuff. Is that the kind of thing that SEAL Team 6 does? Yes, yes. They would give Michael newspapers from Chicago, New York, Boston, Texas, California, and he could actually go through the newspaper and see what the cells were sending here in this country to the bad people and decode them and see what they were saying and figure out some things. Hmm. Yes, we didn't, we didn't know he was that smart, you know, and he was smart. We didn't know he could, you know, he had a natural gift from God. After about 18 months, SEAL Team 2 in Hawaii, uh, he had to buy a house in Chicago. He had to live near the secret base in uh, Virginia Beach, which ain't secret no more. He was 21. He bought a $300,000 house in Virginia. I was like, where are you getting the money for this? And they, you know. He actually bought the house with it with his yes, own money? Yes, yes. This wasn't a Department of Defense property? No, he bought his own house. I bought a house when I was 22. He was very proud that he beat me. <laughs> yeah. He paid about a uh, hundred times more than what I paid for my house. He had a beautiful home. Uh, he was about six hours from Philadelphia, and we would take the train down and take the ride down to beautiful Virginia Beach. He had to be 20 minutes from this certain place for him. He didn't talk much about it, you know. He didn't. He didn't say much about what he did or anything else. Like uh, mm-hmm. he loved P.F. Chang's. It's a famous restaurant chain. I don't know if you have them over there. Uh, it was a Chinese place. He loved P.F. Chang's, and uh, we were sitting there eating dinner one night, and uh, I was trying to get some information out of him. And he said, "Dad, you know who's sitting next to us?" And I looked over. And I said, "It's a husband and wife." And he said, that's what you think. What did he mean by that? You don't know what the husband and wife. It could be somebody spying on him to see who he's talking about. And um, they gave him a lie detector test every two months. And the first question would be, when was the last time you lied? So it was a loaded question. And uh, So he, he was privy to a lot of sensitive information. And so is that right? He was being surveilled in various ways yeah. to make sure that he was keeping his mouth shut. That's what I believe, yes, sir. Were you aware that he was conscious of being trailed more around the time of what happened? Did it seem like it was happening more, or was it just normal? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. He called home here in April 
of 2011, two weeks before the Bin Laden raid. And he said, Dad, everything's going to be shut off. I love you. Uh, you're not going to hear from me for like two weeks. I'm like, what's going on, Michael? What's going on? He said, if you hear something, then you'll know. And sure enough, the Bin Laden raid was May 1st. And Michael came home in June, a month after the Bin Laden raid. I didn't know he was part of the Bin Laden raid. I didn't know what would, you know. Hmm. He never talked about it. And he grabbed me and uh, by the bicep. And uh, that was the first time he talked about a will. A will? A will. A will. Yes. He said, I left you there, so I left mom that. I left Charles there, so Caitlin, you know. And uh, three times he did that during this weekend. He also grabbed me by the arm and said, Dad, you would not believe what's going on in this country. I'm like, what's Mike, you know, and uh, he wouldn't talk about it, but he was different. Even his friends, he, he stopped at my sister's house, Aunt Maggie, told her about the world. He never did nothing like this, mm. you yeah. know, and, and, and he was with the elite team for four years. Right. And all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. Now, this was after the Osama bin Laden raid that he started talking about this will. Yes. So not before it, because that's what I would have expected you to have said. Oh, you know, he was going on this raid. He wasn't talking about it. We knew afterwards that's what it was. But before he went, he talked about this will. You know, it would be dangerous. But here you're saying the mission was over and yet he was talking about a will. That does seem odd. And, and you say he'd never talked about this before. Never. Never. And he never said you wouldn't believe what's going on in this country. And he would know, you know, uh, he was in very, very deep. He was with the cryptology, the code breaking and information and, uh, you know, so. And the will, you say he broke it down. He told you that so-and-so would receive this and so-and-so would receive this. He was quite detailed about what was in the will. Yes. Did you see it? No, no. no uh, Have you been able to see it since? Have you had access to it? No, he, uh, he lived with a girl for four years, very nice young lady. I'm not going to say much about her, sure. but she seemed to disappear with uh, all the money. I know she gave my daughter some, but she didn't give uh, the other kids anything else. So, very strange. She lives in Chicago, I know that. We haven't heard from her. I tried reaching out and haven't heard nothing back. That was a few years ago. It's, it's been uh, 54 months since my son got killed. Uh, all this will be five years. Do you know if anybody else, any of the other families, talked about their sons saying, hey, I've got a will? Is this just Michael who was saying this, or were others saying it as well? Well, the one family from Florida, son called and mentioned um, to race everything from social media. Another guy uh, said something else to his mom, but she was pretty uh, devastated. She don't talk. They all, they all knew something was going on with the leak. I mean, the one guy had all his family come down to Virginia, which he never did. Even his grandmom, he made come down to say goodbye before they went on this last mission. So I think, you know, in my heart, I, I think they knew that there was corruption going on with our government, with the heroin that's coming to the United States, the money. Was it Bin Laden? Wasn't Bin Laden? Some people say it was. Some people say it wasn't. I do get emails here and there from the guy that says he killed Bin Laden. Then, then I watched his interview on a television show, and the guy asking him if he killed Bin Laden, and he waits about three seconds, and his answer was, I guess so. It was on a couple of television shows here in the United States. You'd think you'd know for sure if you did it, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, not too many people that ugly has been lighted. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask you what you think, Charlie? Do you think that uh, the Osama bin Laden raid was everything that we've been told it was? Um, some days you want to believe it, some days you don't. I mean, I, I've looked into it. Uh, people that live near there said he, uh, he wasn't around. Some people say he's dead. And then you, then you have uh, the conspiracy people say he's making pizza in Chicago. <laughs> you know, where Barack was <laughs> Obama's from. I mean, you know, you hear all kinds sure. of things. You know, uh, yeah. me, I, I'm more concerned what happened to my son. And he's, and he's 38 guys on that helicopter. Uh, you know, eight Afghans were on that helicopter. They don't know the names of them people. Uh, you know, that was uh, part of their story. So he said to you that day, you would not believe what's going on in this country. Did he tell you anything more about what he meant by that? No, he would keep it close to the vest, Julian. He didn't open up. Right. That was Navy Honor, was that? Yes. Yeah. 
And what was he like when he said that? Did he seem to be frightened or was it, was it just a sort of off-the-cuff remark? Did he seem depressed or anything like that? No, no, no. He seemed angry. And that was when Michael came home, Michael would wear like checkered shorts, a big collar shirt with an alligator on it with his hair sticking up, a flannel shirt and, and uh, dress, you know, real like lackadaisical to say, you know. Uh, he stayed low key. He stayed low key. He never told nobody about, you know. He told when, when one of his friends got killed over there, uh, Adam Brown. Uh, there's a book called Fearless about Adam Brown. Uh, that shook him up. I think he was right next to that guy when he got killed by the Taliban. And, uh, and then what I hear from other military guys coming home, um, i tell you what, I was at a convention the last four days here in Pennsylvania for um, bow and arrows, hunting and fishing, a great outdoor show it was called. And there was a lot of military. I ran into three Marines that stopped at my table. Three SEALs, I'm sorry, three Navy SEALs that were in when this happened and or was just got out. And all of them really said, do not stop asking questions. And the one kid started, he had a tear coming down his eye. And he said, good luck, Mr. Strange. Something's definitely, definitely wrong. 38 guys get killed and 22 of our best. And they're all our best. You know, a lot of questions, unanswered questions. So is it pretty much all of the families who are still deeply unsatisfied that the questions are not being answered? Is it pretty much everybody? Well, now the time goes on. I think part of uh, the grief, you have to believe it was, you know, I think their mindset's uh, not all of them. Mm. Terribly difficult to cope with. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I've heard from six dads, six fathers in the last 30 days. You know, what do you think happened? Da, 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 da. What do you, you know? You know, there's so many questions. Yeah. Well, we're going to go into some of those questions in a few minutes. Um, so let's just get this clear then. So he said to you, you would not believe what's going on in this country. And he said to you, is it three times? I've got a will. So it was clear to you from that, that there was something seriously wrong. And this was after the Osama bin Laden raid. Yes, absolutely, sir. It was June 2011, a month after the bin Laden raid, he came home. And that's when he grabbed me about the will. And he said, Dad, you wouldn't believe what's going on in this country. First time my son ever spoke up like anything about a will or about what's going on in the country. Even his friends, everybody knew something was up with Michael. Something was different. And he left early. He went back home early. He never left Philadelphia early. Okay, so we're going to look at the actual event itself, the Extortion 17 event. But just before we do that, I want to set the scene because you had a meeting at Dam Neck Navy Center and this was after the tragedy had happened. And I want to talk a little bit about this because I understand that you were given a presentation by the authorities, and because of that presentation, you asked questions, they gave information, and it just was not satisfactory. You weren't getting your questions answered. So let's get a picture of that first. What happened at Dam Neck? Well, October 2011, three months after my son was killed, they had all the parents go down to Dam Neck, Virginia, and we're in the theater, and General Cole, General Jeffrey Cole, did the investigation over in Afghanistan, and, and I want to add, uh, he did the investigation of everybody being killed. I think he did it in 24 days, which is something I always forget to say, that like, how do you do an investigation in 24 days on 30 guys to get killed, 38 guys to get killed, 38 men, and the dog part. So... We're um, in Dan Neck, Virginia, in this theater, and Jeffrey calls there, and there's some many four-stars and three-star admirals and generals there. There's some other young men, and uh, we're in this theater, and he's telling us what happened. I raised my hand, and I said, well, I'm driving after action report. And he looks at me, because he didn't think anybody was going to ask any questions. He said, it's in the book, sir. And as he's talking, I raised my hand again, and... Uh, I asked him about the black box, which is really orange. And then in a theatrical way, he raised his arms and he said, a flash flood came and washed it away. A flash flood? Washed the black box away in Afghanistan. My son was killed in the Tangine Valley, which you can Google. There was no rain there since Noah had an ark. 
I'm just exaggerating that. But there, you can you can go on Google Maps and weather, and you know I've had over 100 people send me the the weather there, and there was no rain, no flash flood. So they said that the black box, or which you say is actually orange in color, but nevertheless it's called the black box. It's the flight recorder, isn't it, of the things that happen on the flight, and that this was washed away by a flash flood. That's the official position. Yes. Now, the notes that you gave me from one of the other family members, uh, Doug Hamburger, he makes this point. He said that it should have had a homing device, and he says it's unlikely that the box would have been washed away, but it would have been found because, he says, all the bodies and body parts are said to have been found. The area had been sanitized. So how come the black box wasn't found? Have you had an answer to that? No, we, we never got an answer for that. They can be found... Um 13,000 feet in the ocean. They've been found in swamps, you know. They told us they could not find the black box, the recording device. Hold on for one second. My wife wants to say a few words. Mary Ann. Sure. Mary. Hi, how are you? Hi. I'm fine. How are you? I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. Thank you. Nice yeah, what you. I wanted to point out was this. In our 1,364 pages um, with the black box, Julian, what they did was they spent, I think it was two or three days with hundreds of military looking for the black box. Uh And why? Why would they spend all this time with all these people looking for a black box if it wasn't on the Chinook? I mean, they would have known whether it was on there or not. Right. Right. And, you know, I went on to Boeing's website and Boeing has to, you know, on every plane that they have and every helicopter, whatever it may be, there has to be two kinds of recording devices on every single Chinook, on every helicopter and every plane that they own. It's, uh, you know, just to cover their own, their, you know, their company and, and them. So, you know, my point is, why would they spend all those hours and manpower to look for something that now they say wasn't even on there? Oh, they say it wasn't even on there now. Is that right? Yeah. They say there was no black box. Yeah, that doesn't make sense, does it? It sounds like something dodgy has happened with the black box and there's been a split of command and, and one command knows what's happened to it and the other command doesn't, such that they've sent this team out to look for it. It certainly sounds like that. Right. There's something on those recording devices and the black box that people don't want us to hear or find out about. That's my thoughts anyway. Well, that does seem to make sense. Right. Now, you say that there was a book given to you with 1,364 pages. Could you tell us about that book? Well, actually, when I downloaded that disc, that first of all... I don't know about oh, you don't know about the disc? Wait, hold on one second. My husband's going to tell you something, then it'll come back to me. Hold on. Yeah, no problem. So we're, we're in Dan that Virginia Jeffrey Colts telling us it's in the book. It's in the book. Mm. And um, when we get home, there's a folder... And like a day or two later, you open it up because you're out of your mind hearing about how your son died. Mm. You open the book up. There's no ink. There's no toner. You can't read it. You can't read. You mean it's you mean it's blank? Just about blank. You couldn't read it, Julian. There was our government's pretty poor. They couldn't afford any ink. <laughs> was that just your copy, or was that the other families too? Everybody's family. I called up and asked for a new copy, and they said we got a lot of complaints about that, Mister Strange. I said, okay, send me another one. He said, we can't. We burned it. We got rid of it. They burned the original? That's what they said. (laughs) That is incredible. So they they actually gave it out to the families knowing that it was unreadable? Yes. Extraordinary. Sad. Absolutely. And you were given a disc. Was that with the binder, with this book? Yes. Yes. And the disc, um, that's where my wife comes in. I let my wife explain what she did to get the 1,364 pages. Okay. Okay, so like my husband said, October 12, 2011 in Damnak, they give us a two-pocket folder. And, uh, you know, on one side was the booklet that Jeffrey Colt was talking about. You know, it's in the book, it's in the book. Uh And that was actually the summary of Jeffrey Colt, Brigadier General Jeffrey Colt's findings of his investigation. Okay. You know, and like Charlie said, you couldn't read it. There was no ink in it. There was no toner in the in the printer. So on the other side was this disc that the government gave to us. Mm-hmm. Okay, 
and I pop the disc into my into my desktop computer, and it comes up all these little blocks. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, it's like a game. You know, I had to push the blocks, and here it was a sequence. You know, uh, you had to push the different. It took like six and a half hours to do. Every time I figured out the sequence, then it would open up another page with less blocks, less blocks. Anyway, finally, I got to the 1,364 pages. And what we were reading on the Internet was insane. So I decided to print it out. Like I said, it printed out 1,364 pages of Brigadier General Jeffrey Colt's investigation. And it's all sworn testimony. Well, I want to back up for a minute. When I put that disk in the computer, we come to find out it was encrypted with a virus. <laughs> a virus that wasn't even out yet that nobody has ever seen yet. And it sent all of our electronic information to a satellite. This is what our IT guy tells us. Our IT guy is ranked number 39 in the world. Okay, you know, and that this is everything that he told us. So the, anyway, you know, so the, it just, was, just get it clear. So the disc that you were given by the authorities had a virus on it. You're sure that it was on that disc? Absolutely, one thousand percent sure. You know, um, I was the very first one to figure out the disc and to print it out. None of the other parents did. You know. Um, I watch my husband every day out of his mind, you know, the sadness, um, just mm. the whole thing. Mm. The thing is, I'm Michael's stepmom, so I have one foot in and one foot out of the box, so nobody else even thought of downloading this desk. Oh, okay. Um, right. And me and my husband sat on the information for a couple months. We didn't know who to trust to, to go to. This was pertinent information that talked about man pads being there. You know, it talked about the seven Afghans that got switched out. Like, it was information that we didn't know what to do with. Hmm. So, you know, I was the first one to do it, me and child. And, you know, it's... Uh, and it was difficult to do. I mean, it suggests that whoever designed the disc wanted to make it as awkward as possible to get hold of the information. Right, yeah. They said that the disc wasn't supposed to be in the folder. They were going to ask for it back, but they didn't want to raise any red flags. This is what they told um, one of the parents. It's all very <laughs> weird, isn't it? Yeah, it is very, very weird. Right. Yeah. Um, well, how did you know it put a virus on your computer? What tipped you off to that? I'm, I'm going to let my husband explain that to you. Okay. Um, and it was through our IT guy. So I'm going to give you back to Charles, uh, Julian. Sure. Yeah. Hello? Hi. Hi. Hey. So my wife figures out the disc. And while she's figuring it out, I went on a weekend called Vet's Journey Home. They help the guys that are coming home from war with PTSD and... Uh, the guy called me up and asked me to come down for a weekend with the man. And at first I said no, and he was persistent. It was it was a great experience. And while I was there, I met a guy named Dave S. who uh, mentioned he worked on computers. And that was about it. And he was a nice guy. He was a Navy vet. And I got home, and the wife said, oh, our computer this, our computer that. I called this guy up. I meet on that weekend. And like my wife said, he's one of the best computer guys in the world, which I didn't know. Hmm. And he tries to fix it from his house, but I have to drive it down south to where he lives. And I uh, give him the computer. We're in his living room. He opens it up and he goes, oh, my God, Charlie, what they have in here, they didn't even come out with yet. And it was eight numbers dot gov, NSA, 12 numbers dot to the CIA, Central Intelligence in Maryland. And there was like quite a few of them. And he said, wow. And he documented this. And that's how we brought a case against the NSA here in America, the National Security Agency, which uh, was collecting mass quantities of phone calls and going into people's computers here in this country. So was the computer behaving in a strange way? It was a blue screen. It wouldn't move. It got stuck. Our computer, we didn't have a webcam. Are you sitting down for this one? We didn't have a webcam, no camera on our computer. They took my wife's picture. She was sitting in front of the computer, and she was getting ready to do something. And I, I'm in the bedroom. I hear her scream. I'm like, what's the matter? I come running out. And I look at the computer, and it's a picture of my wife sitting in front of the computer. I said, oh, how'd you do that? She goes, they just took my picture. I said, oh, my God, how'd they do that? 
And then they warned FBI, 20 years in prison for cyber, da 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 da. I said, what the hell is this? All the televisions, ABC, NBC, all came to our place, our home here, did an interview on that about the NSA. And all their camera guys from the TV stations go, do you mind if I look at your computer? I'm like, go ahead, buddy. And they said they came through the wires somehow and took her picture because we don't have a camcorder or a camera on our computer. Bizarre. I, mean, I have to say, I don't understand that at all. That is bizarre. But I mean, the, the picture I'm getting is that somebody really didn't want you to look into this. I mean, trying to scare you off. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I had a guy just when we were beginning come up to me and pull out his phone and he said, Mr. Strange, I can hear every conversation you have. I get every text message you have on this phone. I could be a block away. He goes, and you can walk up to me and I hit this button and you don't see nothing. I said, oh, yeah. I know what he was trying to tell me. No matter what you do, I don't do nothing wrong. I ain't doing nothing wrong. I'm asking questions about what happened to my son. I pay my taxes, you know. Absolutely. This is the thing with this kind of thing. It can either put you off, can sort of scare you, or it can have the opposite effect and make you think, well, hey, why are they doing this to me? There must be some reason. They don't want us to find stuff out. They don't want us to ask questions. So it can work both ways. And obviously with you, it's it, it has worked that other way because you're still asking questions and I you know, highly respect you for doing that. And we're going to, of course, we're going to be talking about what actually happened. But just before we get on to that, I want to ask you how you found out about what had happened. Did you have an official visit that came to the home or anything? like that they were actually at my ex-wife's house and um my daughter called me and uh and said and uh yeah that was julian oh my god it's you know if you bury your mom and dad you're supposed to if you you lose your wife or your husband you're a widow you bury a child they don't even have a yeah. Uh, what, what do you call that? You know, so it, that was the worst day of my life. And I went over there uh, to my ex-wife's house. Uh, she only lives a few blocks from us. And there were four guys out in the street. And uh, they didn't know what happened. They said, uh, the poor young Navy guys, they're like, oh, there, there was a helicopter accident. They didn't even tell us the truth there. They told these young guys to tell us they, they don't know nothing. We didn't find out what happened. It, it was on television. Actually, cause I... The president of Afghanistan mentioned it first all over the world because my friend has a Russian girlfriend who called and said, did you hear what happened to SEAL Team 6? Because I was mentioning it, and then it was on the national news here that uh, that um, the helicopter was uh, taken down. As I said to you before, I, you know, I can't imagine. I, I do sometimes, you know, I have a daughter, and, you know, it does cross your mind sometimes, you know, what would it be like if we lost her? And I... Yeah, it doesn't take me long to think, I don't even want to go there. You know, the thought is just, just, no. just even the thought of it is so horrendous. So I, you know, my heart goes out to you for, for what you've experienced. Um, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Um, I think you're very brave to, as I say, to carry on with this. Um, so anyway, let's look at then what is held to have happened. Obviously, there's an official version of this, but there are so many questions about it. So this is on August the 6th. This is on 2011. This is in Afghanistan in the Tangi Valley. So this is a, a few tens of kilometers west of Kabul. And there was this helicopter that Michael was traveling in, and it got shot down. So let's start with the official version of events, um, and then we'll look at some questions as we go along. Could you give us a brief sketch of what the official version of this is? The official version was the uh, rangers were pinned down. The rangers were in trouble. So that's why they called it IRF, which is called the Immediate Reaction Force, which is SEAL Team 6. I'm sure, you know, like I was telling you, Michael and them guys, they heard the other guys were in trouble. Let's go help them. And uh, that's how they got them all in the helicopter. I believe that with all my heart. Yeah. Okay, so we've got this ranger-led force that's out there in the Tangi Valley. And thereafter, somebody called Kari Tahir, is that right? Yes. And he was a Taliban leader of some repute. Was he an important person that the coalition wanted to get? Yes, yes. He was supposed to be a high-value mark. Okay. They came out. First, it was they were there to help the rangers. And then three days later, on national news all over the world, they redacted the story that the rangers were in trouble, that they were after Kari Tahir. First, you said he went in to help the Rangers. Then all of a sudden, it's not a retro quarry. I hear they can't even get their lives straight. 
and you're talking about my son that was killed for this country. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to be kidding me. It, you give me papers with no ink, no toner? Yeah. You know, and... Uh, so you Yeah, so we've got this group of rangers, this ranger-led force that's out there. They're doing their job, but it's also planned that there will be this immediate reaction force, was it called? IRF, Immediate Reaction Force, SEAL Team 6. So that was planned. They were kind of on standby to be used if necessary. And on that Chinook, there were 38 men altogether and a dog. Correct. So that was 15 SEAL Team 6 members, including Michael, two other Navy SEALs, eight other U.S. Navy or Army personnel, seven Afghan Special Forces, and there was also an Afghan interpreter. Have I got that right? They were all on this CH-47. Yes. CH 47D from 1960. Right, I need to ask you about that in a minute. Okay, so they were then, it was deemed that they were needed at a certain point during the mission and they were brought in. But there are several strange things that happened then because you say that the seven Afghans, the special forces, were swapped at the last minute. Have you received any information as to why those Afghans were swapped over? No. No information, no names, nobody was questioned from the Afghan side. Just before the helicopter was ready to take off, the seven Afghans that were on the helicopter got off, and seven different ones got on. And were the Afghan military involved in General Colt's investigation at all? Were they part of that? No. But I do have the 1,300 pages in front of me, and no coincidence, I think God's working for us here. General Colt asked the I.O., which I don't, I'm not sure what the I.O. stands for, some military term, was there a flight manifest? And J-3 answers, J-3 is uh, JSOC, some part of Naval Special Warfare Development. J-3 answers, yes, sir. And I'm sure you're aware of the seven Afghan personnel that were not listed but were on extortion 17. But the bottom line is, and this, and this is for uh, any of your listeners want to look this up. It's J-S-O-T-F, C-D-R. But the bottom line is, we knew the total number that were on the aircraft. We knew the total number that we were trying to account for from the ground. So they knew there was 38 men on there and the dog, but they just didn't know the names. It's right here in black and white, right in front of me. I have like 12 pages in front of me here. So those Afghan military, they didn't know what the names were. They weren't on the flight manifest. No, they actually uh, one of the higher up military guys told one of the family members they had to call the parents up of the Afghan military and they call them back and tell them they had the wrong guys. Yeah. Yep. How sad is that? I tell you, your kid's dead, and then no, no, the wrong person. But what is, what is going on here? Right. What's your understanding of the purpose of this mission? You know, the the bringing in of SEAL Team Six. What were they brought in to do? What was your understanding of that? Well, after the Rangers weren't in no trouble, and it says it's like five or six times in my thirteen hundred pages, and they changed the story to after quiet I hear that they're going to get this high guy, one of Bin Laden's. Uh, higher up guys and, and uh, that's what they were going to get but nothing makes sense because the rangers were there the rangers actually caught some of the guys not quite Tahir quite Tahir his guys moved to a different village because they knew SEAL Team 6 was coming how did he know it's in the paperwork and have you had any answer why all the crew was put onto one helicopter because I understand there were in fact two Chinooks involved Yes, there was another Chinook helicopter behind them, empty. All they had was the flight crew. Why would you put everybody in one helicopter? I'm from the, you know, streets of Philadelphia here. You don't walk down the same dark alley, you know what I mean? In some neighborhoods, you know, you, you go around or you go outside. It's common sense. Whoever made this call, I, I would love to just talk to them. I would love to see their bank account. I'd love to see it. Like Jeffrey Cole, we can't get all of him. He got promoted after he did this briefing and, and this and this horse and pony show. He got promoted. He's now Brigham Deer General Jeffrey Cole, you know. But I, I believe he will, you know, he'll have the answer to uh, the big guy at the end. We all have the answer at the end, I believe. Yeah. So this, uh, this Chinook goes in. We'll talk about what cover or lack of cover that was involved. Anyway, the, the Chinook goes in and then it gets picked off by some Taliban. Can you describe what happened there? Yes. 
They're all in this snook and they're going into the TNG Valley. Now, they're not going to let them get out where the Rangers got out. The, the Rangers were left five miles away. They didn't go into the TNG Valley, the Rangers. But they're sending the SEAL Team 6 in this giant Chinook. But it's three buildings, and it's pitch dark. It even mentions the night vision goggles weren't working, they, they said, for our guys. But the night vision goggles were working for the Taliban, because the Taliban were along a tree line. They said, uh, like, 50 of them, 50 to 100. They had motorcycles, RPGs, man pads, AK-47s, walkie-talkie, cell phones. It's all in the 1,300 pages. They're under these trees. And then on the tower, there was three guys. They actually call in and ask about the guys on the tower. They said uh, they called the Afghan administration. And the Afghan administration came back and said they were hanging crops at 2 o'clock in the morning. And these were the guys who actually shot it down, is that right? Well, that's what we, we, we assume. We assume it was one of them. It could have been closer. It could have been somebody from under the trees. If it was a man pad, it could have been a man pad, a heat-seeking missile, which means anywhere the, you know, the engine is or, or the propellers, that's where it's going. But they were 50 feet from landing. The other thing, and I don't talk about much, after this weekend and talking to some of these men where I was, about all the IEDs, those IEDs, explosives around the buildings, traps all around, Julian. I, I never usually talk about that, but it's in the paperwork. They found like 15 IEDs all in this area. So if the guys would have got out of the helicopter when they were running, they would have been hitting the IEDs. Or if more people came in to help, they would have been hitting the IEDs. Um, you know, Jeffrey Colt told us it was a lucky shot. I, I couldn't believe he would use that terminology with 60 parents that lost their kids. Yeah. A lucky shot it would have been if they missed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I was asked to sit down when I, I went a little crazy when he used that terminology, too. And uh, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. Right? Sounds like he opens his mouth before he thinks, doesn't it? <laughs> Do yeah. yeah. So you say that the Afghan authorities were called up about these men who were on that building. Was that in real time? Was that as it was happening that they were called up to ask, who are these people? Yes. They were told they're just hanging crops, don't worry about them kind of thing. Yes. Now what, what kind of backup was there for these two helicopters going in? Because my understanding from the notes you gave me from Doug Hamburger was that there should have been support from a drone, there should have been support from a fighter helicopter of some sort. What was provided? Yes, there should have been. There, there was the AC-130 fighter ship, which is pretty powerful. I wasn't in the military, and everything you hear me say is from the 1,300 pages, and what I read is from them. They were moved. The two that were supposed to be guarding the Chinooks were moved to another area. I don't understand. They knew the Tangine Valley was hot. It was the Taliban headquarters. So who sent them right into the top bed? They must have known all the Taliban were under the trees. It's in the paperwork and on the roof and in the front. It was like the Taliban set up a triangle and sent the Chinook right into the middle and then it pitched dark. Why would you send them right into... Who did this? Who did this to these men? Who did this to my son? This is... And nobody answers. Nobody, you know, 38 guys died and they said it was a lucky shot. I mean, come on. There's something wrong here. Mm. And nobody's taking mm. accountability. Uh, I've talked to the president of the United States here, Barack Hussein Obama, and uh, the helicopter was only 50 feet in the air. I don't know if one of them seven Afghans had a vest bomb on or what happened on there. So many questions. And, and then I think that they give you so many questions. You know, they could do a thing called PSYOPs, you know, to keep you looking. Looking over here, looking over there. After it happens, we're in the, you know, uh, we buried Michael in Arlington with 18 of the guys got buried there. Then they had us up in New York City, all the parents, meeting a Hollywood guy and thanking us for our son's service. Then they took us, two months later, they take you to Virginia Beach. They do a big thing there with your son's pictures, giant. Then 10 months later, they had us back in Arlington Cemetery for the bury the rest of the remains. So what they're doing, you, I look back now, is look over here, look how we're honoring you. Look what we're doing over here, we're honoring you. Look over here, we're, they keep you going. You're playing, and you bury a child, you're out of your mind anyway. It's, yeah. And it's still today, you know, I walk into a store and I'll be okay and then I'll see a kid or I think I'm going and I get real sad. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, so all this is sort of putting you into a daze, where I, I guess, where it's, it's difficult to bring all this information together. Um, I mean, when you sent me that thing from Doug Hamburger, he had about four main questions to do with the kind of safety protocols that didn't seem to be followed. Let me just go through these four to see if I've got the picture right here. So he says that there was a pre-assault fire request made, but that was denied, and that that really should have been there to draw attention away from the approach of this helicopter. Well, that was not allowed. Is that your understanding? Yes. Rules of engagement. And then, as we've already said, there was this protocol to have a couple of Apache helicopters, a C-130 gunship, and a drone all kind of stacked above the Chinook. And that was not there? No. Nope. And he also, nope. sa- he also says that the camera on the drone was not working. Is, is that right as well? He said all three cameras had a glitch in them. Had a when our sons got killed. Had a glitch. Exact words. This is uh, General Colt said this, is that right? Yes. Um, he also says that the landing area was not inspected properly. He says, why didn't the two Apaches inspect the landing zone in good time? That was protocol. They did so, but it wasn't until three minutes before Extortion 17 was due to land. And when they did that, three minutes beforehand, it was discovered that there were actually two people running around the landing zone, but by that time there was no way anything could be done about that. Is that your understanding, that it was left to the last three minutes? Yes, yes. And there was an understanding that there was a call for the three-minute call, and the one-minute call, and a whole a lot of time elapsed. They didn't even know what helicopter got hit, the guys that were in Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. When Colt asked them, they go, well, sir, we weren't sure what helicopter got hit. They had all the eyes off of SEAL Team 6, off the Chinook helicopter. Are you scratching your head, my friend, saying, oh, my God, this is... I, I, I'm trying to piece this together, and I am i cannot. I'm saying to you now, I cannot piece this together. There are so many questions and loose ends here that, you know, I think it's appalling that you're not getting answers to these questions. I mean, one of the things that Doug Hamburger says here is that, you know, about this glitch business and that the camera was off on the drone, he says we had two soldiers report that they had actually watched Extortion 17 get shot down from two separate forward operating bases. Now, how could they have watched it if, in fact, there was no camera shooting that, if it had this glitch or whatever? That doesn't... It looks like there's a lie going on there. I mean, how do you feel about that? A lot of lies going on. A lot of staging and psyops and and look over here and... uh, you know, they give you so much information, and then, and now I've been thinking lately, the last few months, like, wow, I, I look at these 1,364 pages, and uh, they always had us looking inside through the window. They never let us get inside. They never let us sit at the table, and the one time that they did let me sit at the table, they didn't read none of the pages. Another slap in the face. I was at the Pentagon, me and my wife, in Washington, D.C., right? The Pentagon's our big main hole. And I met a guy named Gary Reed, who was the uh, head with Chuck Hagel, the Secretary of Defense. And him and three other gentlemen sit down, and I give him my questions. And he's like, no, sir, the Taliban were not, da, 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 da. I showed him some of the 13 other pages, Exhibit 89, Exhibit 86, Exhibit 63, here you go. And they're looking at him, they're reading, they go, how did you get this? They almost came out and said, you have too much information. But they never read it. Why would you send somebody that did read it that you might be able to get answers from? That's my thinking. They never read the papers, and they never got back to us. And that was from the Pentagon. Just me and my wife went. There's something else I wanted to ask you about here to do with the Taliban at the scene. And this is going back to Doug Hamburger's notes here. And he says that commanders had told General Colt's team that the Taliban had put 100 fighters in the Taggy Valley for the express purpose of bringing down a U.S. aircraft. What's your thought about that? That is Exhibit 89. Jeffrey Cole asks, what is the outlook for the Tianjin Valley? He used to some of it, assessment of the Tianjin Valley. And uh, the guy says, well, sir, May 11th, 2011, 100 Taliban are coming from the blank Providence to the Tianjin Valley to shoot down the Coalition Air Force aircraft. That's the exact words, Julian. Exact words. They knew May 11th, right, right after the Bin Laden raid, that 100 Taliban are coming from the blank Providence 
to the where my son got killed, the TNT and Barry, to shoot down the aircraft. I mean, they knew. They knew this was a high risk, a top rated high risk area. Oh, yeah, the TNT and Barry, yes. Mm. Now, to add to that, I think I've heard you say this as well, that about half an hour after Extortion 17 was shot down, there were Taliban who were bragging on the internet that they'd shot down SEAL Team 6. Now, how could they have known that it was that particular team? Right, right. Is that right? Is that... Yeah, they knew. They were bragging. We just killed SEAL Team 6. How did you know? How did you know who was in the helicopter? And how did they know to shoot at the first one? There's two helicopters there. Why was the second one empty? Why were so many cabmen under the trees on the roof? They were waiting. Somebody set them up. It goes beyond ambush, you know. And then, you you know, as you were asking me about the Bin Laden raid or what went on over there or, or the illegal corruption that's going on. And how, how can you be in a war for 14 years? If you got the bad guy, why are we still there? Because of the money. Follow the money, the corruption. So I, I just don't want this to happen to somebody else's son or daughter, uh, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Any way you can help us, any way you know from kind of your research, uh, John talked very highly of you. Anybody you can put us in the right direction with, uh, we've been to Washington, D.C., me and my wife, 30 times. We've been there with Larry Clayton, who uh, is our lawyer. We had other parents. We had press conferences. We've been in the paper. The NSA tapped my phone and my computer for asking questions. We won three cases against the National Security Agency. And you still don't have nobody held accountable. The frustration is the anger, you know. Yeah. My son is gone. My son won't be here for Christmas again. His brother will be sad. We'll talk about Michael and then you look around and you go, what happened? 25 years old. It wasn't a car accident. He didn't get shot. It wasn't an IED. And then they lied. They lied about my son. Did they lie about my son? They said the helicopter blew up three times. Got hit with an RPG. It was a bold fire. Four months after my son died, I called up over in the United States. That's where all the bodies come in. And I asked for the autopsy report. They sent me the autopsy report. And my wife said, you're not looking at it. You're not looking at it. I read the papers. They gave us a disc, a whistleblower. She said, my son on the disc. Julian, he wasn't burned at all. He wasn't burned. He wasn't burned. You could look at him and you could see the hair on his arms. And yet when I read Jeffrey Colt's memorandum, it says that the helicopter was immediately engulfed in a large fireball and it dropped in less than five seconds after being hit. So how could he not have been burned? Yeah. What's going on there? Yeah. A lot of questions. Yeah. A lot of questions. And no answers. No. 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 Can I take you back to this business of putting all the men in one helicopter, which is mysterious? Um, I was having a think about this. And I just want to put something to you. I don't think it clears up the problem, but I, I think it's necessary to sort of go through this way of thinking to just see what the problem is. You know, I was thinking that they might have argued, well, you know, we had two Chinook 47s and we put all the men on one and we kept one back at a distance from the landing site to make sure that we still had one helicopter available. You know, if something happened to the first helicopter, then we still got one helicopter left, and that would allow us to get the Ranger-led force out of there afterwards. You know, if we put both helicopters in and they both get shot, and we've got no helicopters to rescue anybody. Now, that that's the only sense that I can make out of that decision, because they say that they made a, a strategic decision to do this. What I don't understand about that is that if that was their decision, that was based on safety considerations, they were thinking about the whole mission, how to get people out of there. If that's right, how does that square with these multiple instances of not applying safety protocols to this very same mission that we've just been talking about? You know, from the information that I've seen, it looks like they didn't fly anything in there to check what was happening. They didn't stack up the surveillance above the aircraft, all sorts of things they didn't do. And yet they're supposed to have made a strategic decision for safety reasons. It just, I can't make sense of that at all, this decision to put all these men on one helicopter. The reason that's given doesn't seem to square with what they actually did. I know, I know. I, I, it sounds like a design for the operation. It, it sounds, you know, because you're talking May 11th. Mm. 
hundred thousand man coming from the Providence to the Tangine Valley, then all in one shot. Look, that it that this sounds like a design plan to kill my son and these men on this helicopter. This wasn't a lucky shot. This was more, you know. And then people say, oh, it was a trade-off. Bin Laden for SEAL Team 6. It was this for that. It wasn't Bin Laden. That's why they got killed. You hear all kinds of things, you know. Uh huh. Let's, let's just take those two then. So one idea is that this could have been a trade-off. So is the idea there that it was a trade with the Taliban to say, look, you give us Osama bin Laden and then we'll let you have the team that got Osama bin Laden? Is that the idea? Well, our president, it was before the election for his second term and he wasn't doing too good. He was like 30% with the people in the United States. And then uh, the whole story about killing Osama bin Laden, which he announced, it was told it went up to 62% in favor of the United States people, and he slid in for a second term as president. Mm-hmm. He announced that Joe Biden, our vice president, announced it three days after the bin Laden raid and made a public statement at the Ritz Carlton in Delaware. Our elite Navy SEAL team just killed bin Laden, and he would tell anybody that would listen which also, you know, put a tag on our son's backs because nobody ever heard of SEAL Team 6. And Leon Panetta, he was the head of Secretary of Defense. He brought people over to make that movie Zero Dark Thirty down to wherever, you know, SEAL Team 6 guys live. So all protocols and SOP, Special Operation Procedures, were broken. It was definitely a design, and you wouldn't think, here's the question you get. They wouldn't kill our own guys. They wouldn't kill our own guys, right? Would they? Well, now you're talking millions and billions of dollars. You're talking national security. You talk about heroin coming in. You're talking about money to Karzai. Karzai is so corrupt. He's out now. But I've met men that were over there and talked about skids of money we would give them people and billions of dollars. And, you know, there's so much. And where, how do we stop it? How do you stop these people? Yeah, well, we we actually talk about this quite a bit on the show, that generally speaking, we're quite happy to believe that these kinds of things could have happened in Nazi Germany, you know, but we think, oh, well, it couldn't have happened in our own countries. And yet there's almost a kind of racism about that, isn't it? You know, we're all human beings. These kinds of horrific things can happen in any country once you get a corrupt system in place. So I think these days we do have to acknowledge that the unthinkable has to be thinkable within our own countries. Um, I think that's just being realistic. Um, I have to say, I don't personally find the idea of the trade-off particularly believable, because I don't understand why, you know, if they made some kind of deal, and then they got Osama bin Laden, why would they then have gone through with the deal? Why wouldn't they have just said, okay, we've got him now, we're not going to honour our part of the deal, you can't have our SEAL Team 6. I, I just don't see why they would have gone through with the deal at all. That's just the way I think about it. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. Right. Um, and I also find it difficult, I, mean, I don't know what you think, but I find it difficult to believe that this was just a Taliban thing. I don't know, say there was some Afghan that tipped off what was going to happen, and then you know the Taliban did it, and there's no insider thing on the US side. I find that really difficult to accept because of all the protocol that wasn't followed. You know, if those safety protocols should have happened, that really suggests heavily that there was somebody on the inside, on the US military side, who was doing this. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. One of them three and four star generals and admirals absolutely had something to do with it. I'm 100% sure about that. It wasn't just Taliban. I'll even go with our administration. Somebody knew, they knew to set everything up. After my son got killed, it was the biggest chain of command in the history of America. All these four-star admirals and generals got moved. August 2011, after August 6th, after my son gets killed, all of a sudden, David Petraeus becomes the head of the CIA. And then Benghazi happens 10 months later. All of a sudden, General McRaven, who's playing the Bin Laden, right? He's a hero, right? But anyway, he's teaching school in Texas for $800,000 a year. He got himself a nice job making millions, millions of dollars. All after August 6, 2011. Admiral Mullen, McRaven, Petraeus, Ibis gets moved. These are all four stars, sir. Mm. 
Yeah. So uh, obviously, you, you know, nobody can say for sure, but um, you know, we're trying to make some kind of sense out of this. And uh, we had a quite some time ago an interview with Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, and he was trying to make sense of it as well. And we were talking about the Osama bin Laden raid, and he didn't buy the official story of that. I've had difficulty accepting that right from you know when it was first reported. So many problems with it, so many implausible things about it. And you're talking about the corruption, you know, the drug trade that's over there as well. And, you know, putting this all together, do you think it's a plausible hypothesis to go with that Michael and the others knew something really fishy about the raid, that it didn't happen as we were told or something really dodgy about it, and also knew about uh, corruption, you know, with drug trade and stuff? And is it possible, do you think, that, you know, people wanted them shut up? I believe so. I believe so. And I think back when me and him were in P.F. Chang's and he said, Dad, look at the people next to you. I said, the husband and wife. He goes, that's what you think. Mm-hmm. So somebody's following him or checking on him and uh, questions, the lie detector test every two months. And then grabbed me talking about that. You wouldn't believe what's going on in this country. And the Bin Laden raid, whether it was or wasn't, these guys, I know my son, Catholic school for 12 years, you know, the conscience and all these guys to help, help people out, you know, but to get set up, there is definitely uh, cooperation from some of these, uh, our government and the Taliban. It certainly looks that way. So I believe they're ready to talk. I, I really do. I think some of these guys on SEAL Team 6 said enough's enough. I know my son, for him to grab me, Julian, and say, Dad, you wouldn't believe what's going on in this country. In this country. It's like he wanted to tell you something, but wasn't quite ready to say it. Yeah. That's how it feels. I told him not to go. Yeah. You know. I'm, I'm so sorry for you. I really am. Really am. It's, uh... And you met Obama, and you spoke to him, and you asked him, and he said he was going to look into this. What happened with that? Well, that was August 2011. All the bodies were coming into Dover. We're in a hangar waiting for uh, our sons to come in. Obama comes up to me, puts his hands on my shoulders, and he says, Michael changed the way America lives. And I grabbed Mr. President by the shoulders. I said, I don't need to know about my son. I need to know what happened. And I started to shake him, and the Secret Service guys grabbed me, and uh, I was doubled over, and I was crying, and... uh, Obama came up again, they gave me another hug, and I whispered in his ear, I said, is there going to be a hearing? Is there going to be a congressional hearing about this? And he whispered in my ear, and I could feel his lips touching my ear. He said, Mr. Strange, we're going to look into this very, very, very deep. We're going to look into this very, very, very deep. Those are his words to you. And that was August 2011, and I never heard... And you've heard nothing? Exactly. Anything from Barack Hussein Obama. Did anybody else speak to you that day? Any other person in authority? Leon Panetta. About 15 minutes later, while we were in the hangar waiting, he came up to me, shook my hand, Michael looked great this, Michael this, and he goes, I'm going to ask the same questions as you, Mr. Strange. And uh, then I threw the F word out a few times, and uh, I said, you're the Secretary of Defense, you could ask the same questions as me. And uh, then the Secret Service guys took me outside with a bottle of water and uh, smoked a few cigarettes and walked. I had to walk before I strangled somebody. You know, as Secretary of Defense, like I told you, I was a union construction worker, labor. I could, you know, you're going you're gonna to ask the same questions as me now, and this is your job? Was that all part of the, the PSYOPs, too? You know what I mean? Like to throw you off? You know, it's crazy, it's sad, it's angry, it's your emotions go, and... You, and hmm. So this was at Dover, was that right, when when the bodies were coming in? Yeah, all the bodies come in at Dover, Delaware. So you've not had answers. They've persistently blanked you, basically. But the families have been trying some sort of congressional routes, haven't you, to get answers. Can you tell us about what you've actually pursued and what's happened with that? Well, from knocking on the doors, we filed FOIA Acts, Freedom of Information Acts, trying to get some things from Karzai, the Afghan government, our own government, our own Navy. Everything's top classified. We filed probably like 20 different, our lawyer, Larry Clayman, 
and been shut down. And then Jason, a uh, congressman from Utah, Jason Chavez, who's on our Armed Service Committee in Washington, D.C., he took an interest. He uh, was going to get us a congressional inquiry and uh, try to get us some answers. And we had 24 the parents writing questions, which means 48 of the parents wrote in questions. Mm. And we were going to have uh, the military people sit down there and the moms and dads, we were going to go up and ask them our questions. And that would, you know, help us with the grief and, and get some closure. Absolutely. And um, two weeks before, Jason said, Mr. Strange, uh, he said one of his cronies, he, he said, uh, Mr. Strange, they said, oh, the parents can ask questions. Everybody except for you, Mr. Strange. Everybody except for you. You were excluded, specifically. Yes. And why was that? Because you'd been asking too many uncomfortable questions. Yes. And my lawyer went ballistic. you got to be kidding, da-da-da-da-da. And I was like, well, they, they don't want, you know, somebody that read the 1,364 pages, such as I did over and over again, or whose wife deciphered how to get it down and everything else. They don't want somebody that knows, read all the pages. And then, then I knew a few of the other fathers were starting to look into it more, and, you know, because you're grieving and you're out of your mind. Yeah. And then uh, they said, two days after that, they said, none of the parents could ask questions. They gave the questions, they brought Congress in, and they gave questions to the Congress to read over what the parents wrote in. And then the military brought Gary Reed, and then the rest of the people weren't even around when our sons got high. They were on people like in different sections of the military, like in August 2011, and one guy was like working in Washington State on a military base, but he was, you know, a commander or something like that. That didn't have nothing to do with it. They just slapped us in the face. It was a disgrace. So who are these people? These are the people who are answering the questions that were written down by family members. Right, correct. All they knew about it was what they had been told by higher-ups in the military. Yes, did you get any answers to the questions? Not at all. I almost got up a few times. My wife grabbed my leg. A couple of the other dads that were there. It was a disgrace. The only one that read the questions from Congress was from Florida. A congressman named Micah, M-I-C-A. He read the questions. He knew that there was something wrong. And they couldn't answer the questions. They couldn't answer it. He asked about the black box. Gary Reed answers, no, the, the black, there was no black box in them helicopters. Well, actually, there's a recording device, but he didn't say recording device. He said black box. You see what they do? Uh, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he asked about the seven Afghans that got on and got off. And Gary Reed lied right there, tape recorded. He's like, oh, we, we have the names of them. They did get on and got off, but we have the new names. Did you question them? He said, uh... That wasn't my job, or somebody did crop sure somebody from our high, you know, number one military in the world. Have you been able to speak to anybody who organized and authorized the use of SEAL Team 6 that day? No. No, we've tried, but with our FOIA Act, Freedom of Information Act, we filed for the names of the commanders who was on site, you know, who put the ball in one helicopter. What happened to the satellites? We filed, our lawyer filed everything. Every like six months, he's calling the courts, he's going to Washington, D.C., asking questions. What's the hold up? They say it's classified because they were SEAL Team 6. They're using that. So, uh, so, so the only name that you know involved with this is General Colt. Is that right? Yes. Is there any way that you can get to speak to him? No. We tried to track down Brigadier Jeffrey Colt. Quite a few times. So the message is, keep quiet. That's how it sounds. Yes. Have you had any apology for what happened at the ramp ceremony? No. No, no apology for that. No apology for nothing. You know what they said? No. It was a lucky shot, and we'll learn from this. I said, you're going to learn from, from my son dying? Are you kidding me? Don't tell me how great my son was and then tell me it was a lucky shot and, and you're going to learn from this. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, something's wrong. Something is wrong here. 
Yeah, it's deeply patronising, isn't it, as well? I mean, looking at this memorandum by Geoffrey Colt here, we have, and he says, um, after conducting my investigation, I've determined that this mission and the tactics and resources employed in its execution were consistent with previous US special operations missions, and the strike forces selected to execute the mission were appropriate. <laughs> so it sounds like, basically, it's pretty much okay. But then, later on, he says something like, you've just said. Um, this is under planning, he says... Quote, the investigation disclosed that the Special Operations Task Force commander did not reallocate the intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance ISR aircraft to ensure surveillance coverage for ongoing Ranger-led assault force and the inbound immediate reaction force IRF mission. While this finding was not a cause of the shootdown or crash, it is a noteworthy aspect of the compressed planning process that should be addressed in future IRF missions. The evidence also disclosed that the employment of aircraft overhead prior to a helicopter insertion should be better synchronised to minimise possible early warning to the enemy of imminent ground operations, unquote. So basically admitting that actually it was not all OK. So he seems to contradict himself in the same memorandum. Oh, uh, this ramp ceremony uh, is extraordinary. My understanding is that this was supposed to be a time of honouring those who died, presumably also the Afghan crew, presumably that's why the imam was allowed to speak. But by the sound of it, nobody checked out what he was going to say. Now the slap in the face. The imam damned our sons to hell. We had translators and, and different people look at this tape. Hmm. One of the other parents received the tape from somebody that was in the Navy, dropped it off at his doorstep. Yeah, and nothing, nothing ever said about that. And... Nothing said about extortion 17, the biggest loss of life in the Iraq and Afghan war, and the biggest loss of life in the history of America, 22 guys from the Dev group, and nothing ever, you know, nobody held accountable. Nobody held accountable. No apologies, nobody accountable. The message you're getting is just keep quiet. As you say, it's just insult after insult. I, I, I find the whole story absolutely astonishing and really disturbing. Um... As I said you know, at the beginning of the interview, I do very much uh, respect you both for the work that you're doing and carrying on talking about this and insisting that there must be answers to this, making more and more people aware of this. And it is my hope um, that I share with you that you know, as more and more people do become aware of this, there will be a possibility one day of some of these questions finding an answer. I do very much hope so. And of course, as part of that... Just as part of it, you have set up the Michael Strange Foundation. But my understanding is that that's broader than simply asking questions, isn't it? You're actually helping people in a very practical way through that. Can you tell us what you do with the foundation? With our foundation, I uh, bring in the moms and dads that lost somebody in the Iraq and Afghan war. Mm. We raise some money. We have a, a couple of fundraisers. And we go to uh, a nice place, nice hotel accommodations. We get a couple big rooms, board rooms, and uh, we bring a grief counselor for the five stages of grief. And opening night, we go through the ceremonies and all that. And then we ask the parents to write two or three sentences about their son. Or maybe something you want to tell your son or daughter. We ask the parents to stand up, you know, introduce themselves and talk. And everybody was shy at first. And uh, eventually, by the end of the weekend, and I, this I know God's working through us and our sons and our spirits, is uh, the parents are raising their hand and, and say, uh, Joey used to do this, and I would say, Michael used to do that, and, and, and you meet other parents, and it's part of the healing. Uh, something happens when you write something out and then you talk about it, I believe. And the kinship, you know, it's called a gold star. Anybody that lost a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife and, and war or a brother or sister, you're a gold star family. You, you don't want to be a gold star family. And um, so we bring these moms and dads in for a weekend to try to help each other. For me, I, I couldn't get out the door. A few months after it happened, I was going to go food shopping and I was going to do this. And I get to the front door and I couldn't open the door. I, I would just sit there and uh, think about Michael and uh, I get real sad and then everything that happened. And finally, I talked to another dad that his son died two years previous and uh, he was going through things. And I felt better talking to him. And I realized, I said, I got to meet this guy. He lives in Pennsylvania, too. And I met him for a cup of coffee and we were talking. And I said, we have to bring more people in. 
So I started the Michael Strange Foundation, and uh, we've done one a year. We bring in an average of about 30 to 40 parents. It's usually two or three nights, four days, and uh, and we help each other. We help each other, uh, you know. Uh, How many families would you say have been helped through the foundation now? We've probably close to 100 parents through, somewhere around there for a weekend. In the last one, we actually had some sisters over 20 years old. We had four sisters and two brothers, all over 20. And you know what the one sister said, Julian? She said, uh, everybody comes up to the sisters, has your mom and dad. She said, how about me? He was my brother. And that really made me start thinking about my other children and how I have to go on in their feelings. My other son, Chaz, I said, uh, how you doing? He's like, I'm all right, Dad. I'm all right, because the kids worry about the parents. And... Uh, I said, how are you really doing, son? He said, Dad, I lived in the same room with him for 18 years. Mm-hmm. We had a lady named Christine Koch. Her son was blown up by the Taliban. And she had a 25-year-old daughter. And uh, the daughter kept saying, Mom, Stephen's going to come home. Dad, Stephen's going to come home. 18 months later, she wrote a note. I'm going to go be with my brother. And she killed herself. I mean, this pain of losing a child or brother or sister is... It, it never goes away. It never goes away. And I believe through the Michael Strange Foundation, uh, we had a mom there. She said, I haven't danced in five years since my son died. And I said to her, you used to be a go-go dancer. She said, I wasn't a go-go dancer. I was a belly dancer. I said, you lived in Las Vegas. And we started to laugh and, you know, uh, the camaraderie, the kinship, the, and, and that's what we do with the Michael Strange Foundation is we, we try to help each other out. Yeah. Very important work. Is there any way that people can contribute to the work of the foundation? Sure. We have PayPal on the MichaelStrangeFoundation.org. We have T-shirts. We have some hoodies. the Team 6 stuff. And then what we do is reach out to the vets. We get the vets to pick people up at the train station or the airport. Mm. Then we pay for the hotel and the food. And uh, because people don't understand, I, I buried my father. I buried my cousin. I buried close friends. You bury a child. You bury a piece of your heart. You made them. It, it's it's. So that's what we do with the Michael Strange Foundation. Yeah, and it is right, isn't it, that it's uh, necessary to talk about these things i think a lot of people seem to think that you know when somebody's lost somebody that they don't want to talk but it's actually the opposite isn't it in your experience you you want to talk about michael you want to keep his memory alive and you want to make his life mean more and more by doing good through his memory and through this foundation that you've created and uh you know i i applaud you for what you're doing and the the fact that you're going on talking to other families and the fact that you're keeping these questions alive you know i think it's so important what you're doing and i really do appreciate your coming on this program taking this time to speak with us and mary too thank you for taking part in the conversation so uh it has been an honor to have you on the program uh, thank you ever so much, Charles and Mary, for being with us on The Mind Renewed today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your support reaching out. And, uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, I'll be sending you emails and updates. And uh, I can't thank you enough. Any suggestions you have uh, for us to try to get some answers? I know you do a lot of investigating, reporting. Uh, anything can lead us direction. Don't think you can hurt my feelings anyway. Sometimes, you know, the uh, only questions, you know, uh, they weren't asked. You know, so we really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. It's no problem. Thank you ever so much for joining us on the show. It's been a great pleasure speaking to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye.